no one knew that night what it meant, the pistol shot that resounded in our ravines on that summer morning in 1914. No one could guess how many more, countless as the grains of wheat on the earth, were going to follow it. And that's why everyone was able to sleep. Only two children, Artemi and I, with our arms tightly around one another while the jackals howled, wept, because our symphony was ending. Tonight, I'm going to read you selections from my translation from this book, um, Eoliki Yi. And um, this book was first published in 1942, and it's in its 26th edition. And this is, in fact, the, the 26th edition. Um, this was a gift from the publishers, Hestia Publishers in Athens, who have kept this book in print all these years. And I was there actually a few weeks ago, and they gave me this book because my copy, because I've been translating this and working on it, my copy is battered and beaten and scribbled in. So this is a, a fresh copy that will probably start getting that way. Um, so um, generations of Greeks know this book. It's um, typically required reading in school, I think middle school, but maybe sometimes high school. And um, Elias Venezis was an Asia Minor refugee who became a defining voice in 20th century Greek literature. Um, the book is a gorgeous memoir of his childhood in Asia Minor before World War II. Um, the, the title, Eoliki Yi, is literally Aeolic Earth or Aeolian Earth. But the word Yi in, in Greek is more than just Earth. Um, it's, a, it's the land, it's a world. So I've struggled a lot with how to translate the title, and I think I'm actually going to do Land of Aeolia, which, although it gets a little bit away from the physical Earth, it conjures something else, which is the mythic world that he evokes in this book. And I think the, the sort of fairy tale world is an aspect of this book that's important. So uh, that's that's kind of that's what I'm working with now. But I guess by the time you have a, a publisher, they can they they might nix your title. But that's my that's my working title, Land of Eolia. So although it is set before World War One, this book was written um, 20 years after the Asia Minor catastrophe in 1922. Okay, so it. The, the book is set before 1914, but it's written in 1942, um, 20 years after the Asia Minor catastrophe, in which all Greeks were permanently expelled from Turkey, triggering an enormous refugee crisis as close to one million Asia Minor Greeks ended up in mainland Greece as refugees. So this defining event is the backdrop of the whole book. So even though it's, a, it's a, a beautiful recollection of childhood, this event of the Asia Minor catastrophe is right there as a backdrop of the entire thing. And the theme of exile and the loss of homeland run very deeply throughout the whole book. Um, and, um, well, I'm going to start reading some selections soon, but I just wanted to say I think it's very, you know, tragic and poignant that now, 100 years later, there is again a refugee crisis in Greece with people taking exactly the same route that Venezis and his family took from Turkey to Lesbos. And that's how this book, this book begins with Lesbos, you'll see, and it ends with Lesbos as the family is packed onto a boat, getting out fast as the persecution of the Greeks had begun. So very quick bio of um, Venezis, because I'm actually, my favorite thing is to read to you, and that's what we should be doing actually in English. Um, he was born in Aivali in Turkey in 1904 to Greek parents. Um, 1914, the beginning of the Greek genocide, the family escaped to Lesbos, Mytilene. His favorite sister, Artemi, who's a central character in the book, died in Lesbos in um, 1918 of the Spanish flu. The family returned to Aivali after the war, but in 1922, when Smyrna fell at the end of the Greco-Turkish War, um, Venezi's family fled again to Lesbos this time permanently. They never went back. Um, Elias himself was taken prisoner in a Turkish labor battalion. He was forced marched into the inter interior of Anatolia. 
He was one of the very few prisoners in his battalion to survive. Um, that was a 14 month ordeal. And when it was over, he joined his family in Lesbos. His first book, and this one got him international acclaim, was the number 31328, which is an account of his experience as a prisoner in the labor battalion. Very brutal um, account. A young man, he was 18 or 19 when he was captured, just graduated from high school, and next thing he knows in this, this awful, gruesome situation. Um, so, 20 years later, 1942, during the German occupation, Venezis wrote Eolikiyi. And that's a whole other thing that he, in the resistance, he was actually working in the resistance, was captured by the Nazis, was imprisoned by the Nazis. And this book he wrote after his release. So I think for me, and I'll come back to this after we read, is um, the idea that a book of such incredible lyricism and beauty came from an author who went such through such extraordinary ordeals. Um, it's one of the most exciting things about the book for me, and it's also, in some sense, a kind of ray of hope in the midst of the current refugee crisis. There is some kind of model of redemption. I want to read. That's why we're here, so you can hear Venezis. And I'm going to just read you a paragraph in Greek, and you will forgive my American accent. I'm not a native speaker. I'll do my best. Um, but I feel like you should hear some Greek before you hear my translation. I'll just read a paragraph, and then I'll read my English. Excuse me. Oh, this is from the opening of the book. Oton paramerisan takimata tuegeu, kiarkisan nanadionde aptovitho tavuna tis lesvu igra stilpna kegalinia takimata idan xafnias mena tonisi toneo tus filo. Itan sinitis mena na taxi devo na ptameri tu criticu pelagu, ke nas vinun stis acro yalies tis anatolis, ke otic serena posteria, itan sclira vuna, cofti theora ti vrahi, i apocitrini petra, tuto do, metoneoni si, itan cati alo, o poso di aforetico. Now I will translate, so the, the very opening of the book and then the beginning of the narration. When the waves of the Aegean parted and the mountains of Lesbos began to emerge from the depths, damp, shining, and serene, the waves were surprised to see the island, their new friend. They were used to traveling from the regions around the Sea of Crete and breaking on the shores of Anatolia. All they knew of dry land were hard mountains, gigantic cliffs, and yellow, rocky land. But this new island was something different. How very different it was. And so the waves said, let us take the news to the nearest land, to the land of Aeolia. Let us tell about the island, the new land that married light and serenity. Let us tell about its outline and its motion, which is so calm, as though it contained silence. Let us tell about the miracle of the Aegean. The waves came and brought the sea's news to the Aeolian shore. Other waves came, and still others, all the waves. They told about the play of the island's lines, the play of harmony and silence. The first day that the hard mountains of Anatolia heard them, they remained aloof. They heard them the next day and still did not react. But then, when it became too much, when every other second they heard nothing but the roar of the sea telling them about the miracle, the mountains gave up their indifference. Curious, they leaned over above the waves to see the Aegean island. They were envious of its harmony and said, let us too make a place of serenity in the land of Aeolia that will be just like the island. Then the mountains moved aside and drew back further inland. 
The place they left behind became the place of serenity. Those mountains of Anatolia are called the Kimindania Mountains. My ancestors worked hard on the land that lies below the Kimindania. When I was born, a large part of the region belonged to our family. In the winter, we lived in the city, but as soon as the snows left the Kimindania Mountains and the earth began to turn green, our mother took all her children, Anthipi, Agapi, Artemi, Lena, and me, and we would go spend the summer on the farm with our grandfather and grandmother. The place was far from the coast, and this was a great sorrow for me at first, since I was born near the sea. In the silence of the land, I remembered the waves, the shells, the jellyfish, the smell of ripe seaweed, and the traveling sails. I didn't know how to express this because I was still very young, but one day my mother found her boy flung face down on the ground as though he were kissing the earth. I wasn't moving at all, and when my mother came to me very worried and lifted me up, she saw that my face was flooded in tears. Alarmed, she asked me what was the matter. I didn't know how to answer and said nothing. <clears throat> But a mother is the most feeling creature in the world, and my mother understood. After that, she took me with her many times, and we went high up into the Kimindenya Mountains to where I could see the sea. While I lost myself in the distant magic of the water, she didn't speak to me, so that I could feel as though we were alone, the sea and I. The time passed in this way, until my eyes grew tired of looking. My eyelids drooped and I lay down on the ground. Then the trees that surrounded me became ships with tall masts. The leaves that rustled became sails. The wind stirred up the earth and lifted it into high waves. The crickets and the birds became goldfish sailing along and I was traveling with them. When I woke up, I saw my mother's eyes above me waiting. Was it beautiful, my boy? She asked, smiling. Oh, mother, with the sea, it's always beautiful. So that was the, the opening passage. And um, this is sort of a long, a long passage I read. Um, I just wanted to mention that that very opening in which the waves are talking and the mountains are talking. That whole lyrical passage was excised from the book in the prior English translation. So that was interesting, shocking to me when I found, when I began translating, when I found out there was another English translation in a way, I was kind of disappointed because I thought, ah, oh, I was gonna be the first. But then when I found it and found out that he cut out not only this passage, but every passage throughout the entire book where aspects of nature are talking to each other. There was no, maybe in 1950, the idea of magic realism was not known. It was not, you know, there was a different kind of realism was popular in the post-war era. And this, either the translator or maybe his editor just said, nope, nope, this is going. So um, I don't even want you to think about what the book would be like without that, because that, for me, that is, a huge part of the magic of the book and by opening with the waves and the creating this magical land it situates the whole narrative right off in the space of myth and fairy tale which is such an important part of this book so that's just a little note and the 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 focus that I wanted to do today was to give you some of those passages which don't exist in the in the previous English translation um, and that they they are throughout the book and they serve as a kind of counterpoint to the main action of the book. And when I was reading the book, I had a very strong feeling that these passages function sort of like choral loads in Greek tragedy. So they step back from what's happening to the main characters and they explore the same themes, but on a, on a mythic and a symbolic plane. And, and these um, passages are are very powerful and many, many of them reflect on the loss of homeland because this is this theme of the book. And, you know, through trees, through animals, 
through nature, through raindrops. Um, they explore various types of, of exile. And there's this kind of cumulative effect of starting to feel that loss of homeland and exile is actually part of, part of nature and part of the human condition in a very, very profound way. Um, the example that I want to share with you um, is about eels. And they talk and fall in love. Um, and, and in fact, eels' reproductive cycle, as you might all remember, uh, involves a journey to the Sargasso Sea. That's where eels are born. Um, that's where they spawn, but then they go out to all the rivers after they're born. So that there is any a scientific basis to this story. Um, so this passage about the eels that I want to read to you is from the second part of the novel, which is called The Symphony of Dawn. So the novel's in three parts. In part one, the children are really quite small. And I mean, I could have read you passages from part one. They're so beautiful discoveries of the world and of nature, the little children. But in um, we're moving quickly forward now into part two, which is called The Symphony of Dawn. And the narrator and his closest sister, Artemi, are adolescents. And um, Artemi is infatuated with a young hunter who works at the neighboring estate. And he pays attention to her until a uh, foreign woman, a Scottish woman, comes to the area. She's the young bride of his master's son. And the hunter becomes infatuated with this Scottish girl. And Artemi becomes very jealous. And then the narrator himself also becomes infatuated with the Scottish girl. So she's, a, she's an important character. Um, her name is Doris. So I'm going to read a, the scene that happens before the eels. Because the I, I get so excited about these sort of choral load passages that I forget to situate them in the, in the action of the, the book. But you have to remember, the, I want you to get a little taste of the action of the book, too. So the passage I'm reading, Artemi has just found out that her beloved hunter is going to take the Scottish girl to see a special cave in the mountains that, that is a sort of sacred place for her and her brother and the hunter. And there is this belief that it's where wild boars go to die of old age. So Artemi finds out that the hunter's taking Doris there, and she's going to prevent. OK, so I'm going to read the part where she tries to prevent, and then I'll take a break, and we'll go to the, the eels. Okay. Artemi, standing in the mouth of the cave, stretches out her arms and opens them. She is like a wild bird that has stretched out its wings. No, no, she shrieks at Doris. You will not go in this cave. Why, she asks. Why won't I go in? You won't go in. You won't go in, shouts Artemi. And she starts saying frantic and crazy words. This is where the old wild boars of our mountain come to die. This is where my brother and I have our secret cemetery. Our lizards and our bats and our turtles are here. Here, she stops abruptly. And then she says it. We came here the first time I met him. She points at the hunter. No one else should go in here. No foreigner. No woman. Doris looks inquisitively at the girl's face, which is stamped with despair. Then she looks the hunter in the eye. Oh, I understand, she says. And suddenly her expression becomes hard. A wave of cruelty covers her face. Her bottom lip trembles slightly. Get out of the way, she says imperiously to Artemi. Let me get by. You won't get by. You won't get by, wails the girl. This is where Doris moves to grab her and push her out of the way. But she stops. She turns to the hunter. Now her eyes are even more hard and wild. Move her out of the way, she orders, looking him right in the face. As though pulled by a magnet, he moves toward the girl. Artemi has also fixed her eyes on him now. They are flooded with agony and an awful question. Will he do what the foreign woman asks him to? It is a wave of agony and supplication. Will he be able to do it? The light and the moment are playing with the fantasies and first dreams of a young girl 
who is about to learn if you win or lose when you dream so much, when you give everything. The hunter's hesitation lasts only as long as a gunshot. Then he goes towards Artemi. Get out of the way, he says harshly. The resolution in his eyes burns like hot iron. Artemi was not prepared to receive this blow. She had not expected this. Her legs tremble. The tears are ready behind her large eyelids, and they wait. You, she stammers, are you driving me away from here? Come on, come on, cries the hunter nervously. Get out of the way. Now the tears have soaked her quivering eyelids. Inside, the memories are in play. The same memories play for one very slight moment in the hunter's eyes. Is this the Roe who used to follow him wherever he went, who always looked at him like a faithful dog, the one he took for the first time to this place of the wild boars? And now he has to drive her out of his sanctuary. The hunter lowers his eyes for one moment. Come on, hurry up, shouts Doris, walking towards the cave. Artemi rushes at her to grab her by the hair, the cascading hair, but she doesn't make it. The hunter seizes her with both hands and throws her down like an inanimate object. The girl falls in a heap on the ground. A sharp rock cuts her cheek and it starts to bleed. Doris and the hunter go inside the cave. Artemi stays there, unable to recover from such a blow. She doesn't move. Only her heart pounds. It pounds harder and harder. Very slowly, Artemi stands up. Something hotter than fire burns her cheek. She slowly brings her fingers to touch it. They get covered in blood. There is not a sound from inside the cave. The girl strains her ears to hear nothing. It is as though the wild boar's cemetery had swallowed up Doris and the hunter. A buzzing comes from a long way off. It must be the cicadas down in the olive grove. There are other sounds too. A camel caravan going down the great road of Anatolia. A lizard hurriedly pokes out its gray line of a body to get some sun. It sees Artemi. The thorns rustle as it passes. It disappears. Now she'll be looking at our dead lizard. Now she'll be touching our nailed bat. Now she is defiling our sanctuary. Now she and the hunter, her heart beats violently. A flash like lightning passes over Artemi's eyes and her face. The flash doesn't go away, but leaves a deep mark. Oh, if only Doris could die. If she could die and never come back. She who took the cave, who took the hunter, who took her little brother. Nearby, Doris's horse is stamping the ground with its hooves. It seems he's thirsty. Unconsciously, Artemi's eyes pass over the horse. She sees his color, his saddle, the strap that fastens the saddle around the animal's belly. The flash that remains on Artemi's face grows deeper. She takes out her knife with a bone handle and approaches the horse. She strokes him. She knows how to get along with horses. Then she bends down under his belly and starts to cut the saddle strap. She leaves only a narrow strip, half the width of a finger. She looks around, not a soul. Artemi is full of fear, flooded with awe for the death that Doris will meet on the ravine when the saddle breaks and she is hurled from the bolting horse onto the rocks. She mounts her own horse and disappears like lightning. So again, that was a long passage. The, the eel passage follows immediately after that. But I'm pausing just for one minute because I'm going to tell you, in case you're worried, Doris does not die. Um, in fact, she doesn't even get hurt. The, the saddle does break and she falls off the horse, but it happens where in a sandy part of the river and she's just fine. So that will happen. So Doris is fine, in case you are worried, worried about Doris. Maybe you weren't after how she treated our, our Tammy. Um, but, but what does happen two chapters later is that the hunter himself will be shot. 
So, um, and Doris and Artemi are the ones who will find him on the path with a bullet wound in the blood right here. Um, this is the family's first experience of the systematic killing of Greeks in Turkey with the outbreak of World War I. So the hunter and then others quickly follow and, and whole villages empty and the, the family themselves is forced to flee. Um, well, well, we'll come to that. I want to go to the eels, um, but a lot changes, as you can imagine, when the hunter's shot. You know, it's, it, already this is very intense, and then we get on a whole new level. Um, so um, the, the, the eel passage, um, so I, I guess, you know, I, I broke, but in fact it goes straight from her cutting the strap and galloping away, and then we have this story of the eels. The eels in the Jackal River understand that the time has come for their great journey of love. They were born far away in the bottom of the ocean, in the place where all the eels in the world go to mate. When they turned two years old, they left their cradle at the bottom of the sea and followed the road of their ancestors. They crossed all the seas and came one winter's night to the Jackal River. There was a moon over the Kimindanya, and it was peaceful now and then, jackals howled into the thicket, but the eels were safe in the water and were not afraid. They were dazzled by the austere tranquility of the Aeolian land and the desolate moon. How beautiful the land of our mothers is, they said. How beautiful our fatherland. They stayed there and lived happily for six years. Then again, a certain night came. The moon again shone high above, the jackals howled again, and a young girl named Artemi, a child of those mountains, experienced the first story of her heart, the first to draw blood in the cave of the wild boars. From very deep inside them, the secret voice came to the eels of the Jackal River, a strange voice that told them to leave, to go far down the river and to come out into the sea. All the eels woke up, they heard the voice's command and they went far down the river and reached the sea. At the shores of the Aegean, they found a strange commotion. They looked around in the water and were amazed at what they saw. All the eels from all the rivers of Anatolia were gathered there. How do you come to be here, companions? They answered, the voice spoke within us. We are going on the long journey. Oh, you too? We're going on the same journey. The voice spoke to us too. And the river eels kept on talking happily and they got to know one another. Only one eel, covered with strange silver skin, did not move from his place. He did not want acquaintances, did not want chatter. He wanted to be alone with the joy that was flooding him. Another eel with shiny skin that also had begun to turn silver, saw him alone and thought that he was sad. What's the matter, she said to him, for you to be alone like that? Do you have some secret that is tormenting you? Where do you come from, asked the solitary eel. I come from the meander. That's the name of the big river where I used to live. Come close to me, said the other eel, you who comes from a big river. Lean over, do you hear? The eel from Meander pressed against the eel from the Jackal River and listens. What is that sound that is shouting inside you, she asks, amazed. It is the voice of our mountain, answers the solitary seal, eel with silver skin. The river brought it down today from the cave of the wild boars, a single drop, and I swallowed it. Now it will travel with me. Now I'll have it inside me the voice of my country. Come along with me. That is how it came to be that the two eels traveled very close to each other, together with their school, and reached the bottom of the distant ocean. They lost many companions on the way in battles they had with other fish, but nothing happened to the two companions because they helped one another. When they got down to the place in the deep where they would mate, they chose a place at the base of some coral to make their home. 
Then the other eels in the school began to change their skin and be covered in silver, their wedding clothes. But the two companions in the carl didn't need to wait. They had been ready since the beginning of the journey. They fell in love sweetly, and when they were tired, they waited quietly for the children who would come. Every so often, the male eel would bend over the body of his wife, and when he heard beating, he would ask impatiently, have they come? Is it our children? No, she would say, not yet. That is the other beating. It is the voice of our country. But when the children formed inside her, the beats got mixed up, and then even she could not tell them apart. So um, the eel passage and the children, it shows there's this kind of spiritual overlap, but things don't line up point to point. And that's again like the Greek tragedy. It's, it's, you enter in this completely elusive world and, and maybe this passage about the eels is commenting on what just happened, but maybe it's commenting on what's about to happen with going with the refugees, or maybe it's commenting on something that happened a long time ago. So when, when you enter into the world of myth, as you do in, in these sort of fairy tale like narratives, you're entering different, different ways of interpreting meaning. meaning. Um, so, um, but there is this overlap with the children's lives where they're even in this passage, she's even referenced in the cave and the, the drop of water. Um, so no more long, long, long. Those are, thank you for bearing with me. I read you some very long passages. Um, before I close, I want to read two paragraphs um, at the very end of book two. This is after the hunter dies and Artemi sees him dead, which is very distressing for her. Um, this scene takes place in the children's bedroom. There are four, uh, five children and they all sleep in one big room. And actually a lot of the scenes in the book, especially the the first chapter are in the children's bedroom, the conversations they have. So um, this is just two paragraphs that same night after the, the hunter dies. And this, of course, the narrator. Artemi, are you scared? Come close to me. I hear the faint brushing of her body against her mattress, and then I see the figure in a white nightgown coming towards me. She lies down beside me. We go under the covers and I hold her tightly in my arms. Her small body quivers with fear and her teeth are chattering. Calm down, Artemi. We'll always be together, you and I. Don't be afraid. It was as though in some dark and unconscious way, the days that lay ahead were sending a message into the depths of that place where magic and fear reside. It was as though they were informing us now that the symphony of dawn was ending for both Artemi and for me with a pistol shot in the Kimindenya, there in the land of the beaches on the path that leads to the great bear's den. The pistol shot took the hunter with it, took him away from Artemi. It also took from me the magic of cascading hair. The symphony was ending. No one knew that night what it meant, the pistol shot that resounded in our ravines on that summer morning in 1914. No one could guess how many more, countless as the grains of wheat on the earth were going to follow it. And that's why everyone was able to sleep. Only two children, Artemi and I, with our arms tightly around one another while the jackals howled, wept because our symphony was ending. Dense clouds from high above and dark waves from deep within us brought us news of the end. In this way, we were the first creatures who, without knowing it, cried in the summer of 1914 in mourning for the world. So, um, so that's the end of part two and then part three in a sense, it's you know it's it's even darker, um, and there are more um, more killings, and an entire band of refugees from a um, village further inland arrives at the farm, um, it, you know, hungry in, in in complete distress, and very quickly, very soon after that, everyone needs to evacuate. So the family 
the, the refugees and they will um, board onto open boats that are um, owned by local tobacco smugglers who help, who are also um, Greeks who help. Um, so I guess I, I, want to, I want to sort of pull this together and conclude uh, for you. Um, I think that one of the most beautiful things in the book and one of my favorite things in the book is the tenderness between the two children, which you saw in that last passage, but it goes throughout. They have this beautiful relationship. Um, and I think that, that, that what's most amazing about this book is, is how it recreates that childhood um, so it's not just the world of Asia Minor, which is extraordinary. The whole cast of characters, the smugglers, the camel caravans, all that, which I didn't get to really share with you, but, but, but also this amazing childhood and relationship. And the, the girl Artemi, I think I mentioned she dies young. She dies soon after they get to Lesbos, she dies, which of course, you know, the author knows when he writes this, and there are a few hints. Um, when you read this book, you kind of feel a, a profound nostalgia for something that you never knew, a place and time you can't even really believe existed. Without bitterness, Venezis conveys a sense of the universality of loss as part of the human condition. Um, there were all those, all these sorts of passages alluding to exile and loss of homeland. But even if you're lucky enough not to lose your homeland, everyone loses their childhood. So. The, the grief, everyone grieves who reads this book. And yet, and I think this is, again, what's so extraordinary is that Venezia somehow, in the face of all that loss, he offers this possibility for redemption. And the two sort of roots for redemption are um, the birth of your own children, even in a place of exile. And then... Um, the other way to redeem the irredeemable loss is through literature. Um, so this book itself is a redemption that, you know, written um, so many years later, he's able to go back and bring out something beautiful and retrieve something beautiful. Um, I guess I'm going to just close by reading the last two lines of the book in Greek to bring it first full circle, and they reference the title of the book, Eoliki Yi, Eolian Earth. Um, so the, the scene, the, the closing scene of the book is in a boat at night, headed to Lesbos um, as, as they're fleeing. It's a, a very beautiful and, and sad chapter that remember, sort of flashbacks a lot of what has happened. But the grandmother leans her head on the grandfather's chest to sleep, and she feels something hard in his shirt. And she asks what it is. And he says that it's some dirt that he's bringing from his homeland to the place of exile. Um, he says it's nothing, and I'll read it in Greek, but, but what it's going to say is it's nothing, just a little dirt, earth, Aeolian earth, earth of my country. So I'll read, the, I'll read those lines in Greek. This is the grandfather. Speaking. I guess he's speaking, and then maybe it's the narrator speaking at the end. Venine tipota, Leo, Ligo Homa, Yi Eoliki Yi, Yi Tu Topo Mu. Thank you. How did I get from being a classical scholar to a modern Greek scholar? What was it about classical Greek? How did I get from classical Greek to modern Greece, which I'm, I'm obviously clearly quite solidly in modern Greece? Um, I was just having this conversation recently with my husband. I, I studied Greek, classical Greek, first in high school. I had the good fortune of going to a high school where there was an amazing PhD in classics who ended up there who taught some of us Greek, and we loved it. Um, came to college, continued Greek absolutely passionate about ancient Greek for a long time, but there was always a little frustration. And the frustration had to do with the fact that no one spoke this language anymore. So I would have questions like, what did the poems really sound like? And, and you know, what did it even, how did you even pronounce it? <coughs> and there were just questions you could never answer. And that frustrated me. So even though I loved classical Greek, and still do, and I find it inspiring, 
I was very frustrated by the gaps. And when I discovered, you know, like a sort of typical ignorant American that I was, you know, in college before it even occurred to me there was this thing called modern Greek literature. When I discovered that there were poems being written in this same language, although the language, of course, it has evolved. Modern Greek is a, is a you know, a, a later version of, of Greek. But in fact, that there are people in Greece writing poems in Greek that was extremely exciting to me, you know, that it wasn't, it wasn't dead at all. I thought it was dead and that frustrated me and then I found out oh, it was not dead. And not only that there are poets writing in Greek, but great poets. I mean, there were, I think, two Nobel laureates from Greece in one decade, you know, Elitis and Seferis, I don't know the years, but, but great poets were writing in Greek, and, but they were writing in a language that people were speaking. So I think um, it was, that, was, that was the leap for me. Uh, ancient Greek was just not alive enough, and I would get frustrated. But I, I've never stopped my love of, of classical Greek, but I needed, um, I just fell in love with this vibrant modern literature, and there's so much there. Poetry, prose, so. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes it yeah. does. And I, plus I love Greek food. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, who doesn't love this beautiful, you know, just to, to go to this beautiful country and walk around, you know, if you walk around in the, this real country where all this, where all this stuff happened and the antiquities and, and the modern, all the, sort of this one Greece that, yeah. I'm still, I'm still in love with Greece, yeah. So why did you choose Zilias Venezis over all? So, I mean, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think, I mean, basically, I think what happened is somebody gave me this book as a gift in 1987 when I was living in Greece, and I started reading it, and actually I didn't under, I thought I was not understanding the Greek because there was something about the mountains were moving and I was like, wait, I, you know, my Greek wasn't even so sophisticated. And, but I think basically what it is, is that he has um, a sensibility that I happen to love. So if I were writing a novel, I would want it to be like this. Like, I think that it, it's very lyrical. It's, it's very poetic and I write poetry. And I, I, like I said, I think if I, if I could write, I would like to be able to write like this, but I feel as though my poetic sensibility matches his in terms of his language resonates for me. So I feel like I can translate it because my way of writing in, in English has some of the same, like not to, I'm not trying to compliment myself because I can't, I can't write like this, but, but, um, it just resonates for me so much, and it's how I want to write, that it just felt like I could translate it. Whereas if I read an author who has a style completely different from my own, I mean, I think a great translator can translate any kind of style, but I chose something that just felt like how I would write. That's, yeah, I guess that's, yes. In the second chapter, do the eel, are the eels a metaphor for Elias and his family? That's, um, that's your, that's, that's for you to answer. Um, I read a story of eels who, uh, I think that, um, there are lots of, there are lots of little stories about animals and even raindrops who go on journeys and lose their homeland. And if you put them all together, I mean, I think that some of them do line up with the family, but in a way, the whole overall thing I think is bigger than that. It's more just about showing how many versions there are of loss of homeland and how it impacts people. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I do sort of relate back to Venezis is the idea of the children, the second generation, the, the love of your country and the love of your children becoming intermingled in a sense because I think that he does, you know, I think he believes that that is a way, and there's some of the other stories kind of indicate that, that, that a second generation, that the only way to heal the wound of loss of homeland is to have a child. And in fact, you never really heal it for yourself. You actually never do, but the child who's born in the foreign country they'll never be homesick for the old country because they were actually 
born, except in a way, and then maybe they are through their parents. But, but yeah, I won't say, you know, if it directly, because it's also elusive that aspects of it do, aspects of it don't, or for one reader, it might be a parallel for another reader, it might really not. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Jonah hates competition and avoids winning, says Naomi. He doesn't want to see a loser. He is the most unselfish person I know, and he has taught me a great deal about humility. <laughs>